Welcome to Trial Site News Weekly Roundup. Broward County doctor using ivermectin off-label combo on COVID-19 patients is working and secures county health protocol approval. At Stanford, shatters records for study startup for NIH COVID-19 study investigating remdesivir and what if a vaccine isn't developed? Now, all of these stories and more starting now. Dr. Jean Raku Reiter, a Broward Health Medical Center physician and his pulmonologist wife, are pioneering the use of the antiparasitic drug ivermectin on COVID-19 patients. In fact, thanks to a recent health board decision, they may actually be healing COVID-19 patients with this off-label regimen. Trial Site News introduced the Ivermectin Australian Laboratory Study and a couple weeks later, a small study in France. Now it is reported that a Florida physician is using the drug off-label on patients despite a recent FDA notice. When used in combination at the right time, the results can be remarkable. Now, his work is getting noticed. The Broward Health Board has approved the off-label protocol. So Dr. Jean Jacques Reiter is using ivermectin by itself and in combination with the treatment of hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and zinc sulfate combination. Now he noted to the local press that if we get to these people early, and what I mean by that is their oxygen requirements are less than 50%, I've had a nearly 100% response rate. They all improve. If they're on more oxygen than that, then it becomes a little more varied. Some people, they don't respond anymore because they are too far advanced. Now, he went on to say that if I wait, every day that goes by is another day when lots and lots of people get very sick, go to the ICU, and many of them die, and that could theoretically even be preventable. And that's why I thought it was so critically important to get this information out there. So how has it worked so far? Well, a couple of weeks after he first tried this combination, he has treated dozens of people with it. And as he put it, results are so encouraging, he called them remarkable. So what about publishing the results? Will that also be on the table? Well, according to Dr. Jean Jacques Reiter, yes, he is currently in the process of publishing a scientific paper and is purportedly some weeks out from completion. Now, how did they find out about this approach? Well, he noted that his wife read the Australian research from Monash University, which is the same study Trial Site News published recently. Now, as you may have seen in our coverage of this ongoing story, the FDA issued a warning which Trial Site News published as well. They cautioned that the drug was approved for use in humans to fight parasites and not to treat COVID-19 necessarily. Ryder agrees, as does his wife, stating that this is what they are doing. And the Broward Board of Health approved the protocol recently for use in all their hospitals. Now, it should be mentioned that Dr. Ryder has stated that this isn't a miracle cure. The message to people stays the same. As he said in a recent interview that social distancing, stay away from people, wear a mask, which I took off for the interview, wash your hands when you bring something into the home, and make sure you sanitize everything that is really the message. So a call to action here. You can get in touch with Dr. Jean Jacques Ryder, as shown here. And remember to sign up for the daily newsletter from trialsitenews.com for the latest COVID-19 updates. Now, let's shift gears here for a few minutes. There was a lot of potential and hope out there, and we will keep up on everything happening around the world in regards to this virus. However, it should be said that, unfortunately, not all viruses are subject to successful human vaccination. And that could be the case for COVID-19 as well. Despite the hope and optimism with dozens of vaccines in the pipeline, what if it just isn't possible to develop a candidate that works? Now, this dismal outlook hopefully will not be the outcome. But it must be understood and factored into any contingency planning at the state, national, and global level. So, recently esteemed science writer Jeff Wise, on assignment for the New York Intelligencer, raised this distressing and pessimistic view. Wise notes that so many successful vaccines addressing viral diseases from smallpox, polio, mumps, and tetanitis, not to mention the fact that we now live in what can be truly considered an advanced biotech renaissance period, that it would seem nearly impossible for one of these impressive ventures to not nail the vaccine. 
But as it turns out, according to Adolfo Garcia Sastra, director of the Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, that some viruses are very easy to make a vaccine for, and some are very complicated. It depends on the specific characteristics of how the virus infects. Now, as it turns out, SARS-CoV-2, the pathogen behind the COVID-19 pandemic, appears to exist on the challenging end of the spectrum, at least according to the researchers queried by Wong. SARS-CoV-2 is closely related to SARS, which killed over 700 in Asia from 2002 to mid-2003. Rachel Roper, professor immunology at East Carolina University, participated in the effort to develop a SARS vaccine and reported that they really are very similar viruses, both virulent and contagious. Now, on the surface, it might appear that one could think that the response to the vaccines might be similar. However, researchers ran into challenges with their animal models. They found that the drugs triggered by the host's immune system unfortunately wasn't successful at defending against the illness. Mr. Wise wrote that Roper fears COVID-19 may be one of those viruses that represents a real challenge for any vaccination product. Wise reminded his audience that the FDA hasn't approved any human vaccine targeting the coronavirus family, whether it be SARS, MERS, and not to mention varieties of the common cold. Now, there is another scenario known as the immune enhancement nightmare. Now, in this scenario, the vaccine actually makes the infection symptoms even worse. Trial site news has monitored the Philippines case where some executives from French Sanofi Pasteur could receive over 40 years in prison. Why? Well, 80,000 school children were given a vaccine known as Dengvaxia, which it turned out that some of the children faced extremely dangerous to deadly reactions. Over 600 of these children died. So SARS-CoV-2 is a wild card. The novel coronavirus can be considered an unorthodox, unpredictable, and unrestrained pathogen. It doesn't mean necessarily that it'll follow a familiar protocol. And as Dr. Anthony Fauci reminded the nation, it follows its own timeline. Which is why WISE refers to a recent study in China that discovered many who had the disease revealed diminished or none at all antibodies despite the recovery. And so the race is on. We here at Trial Site News are an upbeat crew. We published an ongoing list of the 2020 COVID-19 vaccine race. Dozens of companies, governmental institutions, and academic medical centers are working furiously around the clock to develop and commercialize the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Now, Mr. Wise with New York Intelligencer emphasizes the hope that one of them will overcome any obstacles to break free to the finish line. Nevertheless, Wise felt the need to raise the concern of a different outcome. Governments, academic, medical, and research centers in the private sector should collectively convene for a plan B, just in case. Now, elsewhere, a panel of U.S. physicians, statisticians, and other experts have developed treatment guidelines for the coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19. Now, these guidelines intended for healthcare providers are based on published and preliminary data and the clinical expertise of the panelists, many of whom are frontline clinicians caring for patients during the rapidly evolving pandemic. The guidelines are posted online and will be updated often as new data are published in peer-reviewed scientific literature and other authoritative information emerges. Now, we will provide a link in the description below for this guide, as well as in video towards the end of this story segment. So, the guidelines consider two broad categories of therapies currently in use by healthcare providers for COVID-19. Antivirals, which may target the coronavirus directly, and host modifiers and immune-based therapies, which may influence the immune response to the virus or target the virus. The panel's conclusions about treating COVID-19 with various agents that fall into these two classes of therapies are distilled in summary recommendations. Subsequently, the document provides a background information about each agent, such as clinical data about its use, ongoing clinical trials, and known interactions with other drugs that forms the basis for the recommendation. Tables briefly outline the same information. So, guidance for patient care. The guidelines also describe the evaluation and stratification of patients based on the risk of infection and severity of illness. Recommendations in these sections address best practices for managing patients at different stages of infections. For example, outpatients who are either asymptomatic or who have mild to moderate symptoms and are self-isolating, inpatients with severe illness or critical disease. Special considerations for pregnant women and for children who are infected are also included. 
A comprehensive section of the guideline addresses a range of considerations for clinicians caring for the most critically ill hospitalized patients. Now, this section includes multiple recommendations for patients needing critical care, including infection control procedures, hemodynamic and ventilatory support, and drug therapy. And finally, the guidelines include recommendations concerning the use of concomitant medication. These include statins, corticosteroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and certain drugs used to control hypertension known as ACE inhibitors and ARBs. The treatment guidelines panel includes 30 experts drawn from U.S. healthcare and academic organizations, federal agencies, and professional societies. Now, if you aren't familiar with the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, they are the nation's medical research agency, which includes 27 institutes and is a component of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The NIH is the primary federal agency conducting and supporting basic, clinical, and translational medical research, and is investigating the causes, treatments, and cures for both common and rare diseases. For more information about NIH and its programs, you can go to NIH. Gov. And now for our final story of this weekly roundup. Stanford University moved quickly to ramp up the Gilead Remdesivir Global Clinical Trial and enrolled 30 patients quickly thereafter for the adaptive clinical trial. The elite San Francisco Bay Area Academic Medical Center recently began enrolling patients in the NIH-sponsored clinical trial centered on the safety and efficacy of remdesivir for COVID-19 patients. Shattering study startup records, Stanford launched these studies in record time. Now, study startup typically takes two to three months at Stanford, but the COVID-19 remdesivir studies were ramped up in literally weeks. In normal times, a phase three clinical trial often takes months of planning after years of research before such a study can commence, as reported by Tracy White with Stanford Medicine's News Center. Of course, these aren't normal times we're living in today. With a raging pandemic and a frantic race for treatments and vaccines, researchers and the institutions that employ them operate differently in the world of today. Consequently, the remdesivir studies have been ramped up in as little as a week. Hammering this point home, Aruna Sabramanian, MD, clinical professor of infectious diseases and co-principal investigator of the Gilead trial at Stanford, reports, We brought this on fast. We got everything together in a week and we're ready to roll. This type of thing normally takes two to three months to get on board. So, remdesivir. A lot is at stake. Gilead and Stanford are neighbors, both situated in the San Francisco Bay Area's Silicon Valley. As remdesivir has moved to the priority line based on current evidence, the pandemic rapidly expanded. And the hope is that the antiviral therapy originally developed for Ebola can slow down the impact of the viral infection. Now, recent evidence shows promise, as Trial Site News reported back on April 17th, that Gilead recently reported promising updates from its compassionate use program involving 53 COVID-19 patients. Now, we have picked up on anecdotal and sporadic data points as well that the drug can make a difference. However, until large random controlled trials are complete, no declarations are responsible at this time. Now, Stanford Stanley Derasinski, MD, Associate Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases, reported that we have had patients hospitalized at Stanford who got remdesivir under compassionate care guidelines. Some got better and some got worse. Now, at this point, we just don't know. We hope to have results soon for remdesivir, and by then, we should have another trial in the works for the next best thing. So, the company's investigational drug is now being tested at about 100 research sites in the U.S. and abroad, including in China. Moreover, Gilead expects to have preliminary data from a study of severe patients by the end of April. Now, serving as principal investigator at Stanford for the NIH-sponsored remdesivir study is Nira Ahuja, MD, who said that we are hopeful about remdesivir, but we are already planning for what the next drug might be. We want patients to get any possible treatments that might benefit them as soon as possible. Stanford School News reported that Cardinal researchers emphasized the drug results based on years of research with lab and animal research completed, not to mention clinical studies for Ebola. The drug actually failed to prove its efficacy efficacy for Ebola, but did, however, prove that it was safe for humans," reported Philip Grant, MD, assistant professor of infectious diseases at the School of Medicine and co-principal investigator the Gilead trial. Moreover, Robert Schaefer, MD, professor of medicine at the School of Medicine, reports that for years remdesivir evidenced potential in cell cultures and animals infected by other coronaviruses, such as SARS and MERS. Now, note that Schaefer's lab recently developed a coronavirus antiviral research database similar to one that they have accomplished for HIV. 
Now, and as ever, Trialsight News will be keeping an eye on this story and reporting updates as they continue to develop. Thank you for joining us today. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to say to our rapidly growing audience how thankful we are for each and every one of you. Here at Trialsight News, we are planning some fantastic advancements from exciting additional content to enhancements to our video series and an exciting website to facilitate more engagement with the clinical research community. What we call the Trialsight Network is our rapidly growing audience, for which we are so thankful for. And this includes new advertising features for those who want to connect with our readers. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and this has been the Weekly Roundup. We'll see you next time.